Which players for the Denver Broncos that are younger should the team invest more development in with the team sitting at a 1-5 and five record? We'll share our thoughts, and we want to hear from you on today's brand-new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Even though the Denver Broncos sit at a 1-5 and five record and the season feels lost from a playoff hope standpoint, the ambition shot down here, what could the Denver Broncos do to invest in some of their younger players throughout the rest of the NFL regular season? We're going to dive deep into that in today's brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much once again to everybody in Broncos country for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day. Every single day through the good, the bad, the ugly. We have you covered every single day, all year long, because for the true fan look in season, out of season, we love to bring you all the content and coverage and discussion points on the team that you love to root for every single Sunday, even though that this season is a rough season so far here. Broncos country. I'm Cody Rourke, Broncos reporter for Mile High Sports, joined alongside as always by Sarah Bettinger, site expert, predominantly orange.com. Today's episode of the show is brought to you by the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Here you can get us every single day on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Broncos Country, hit that subscribe or that follow button so you never miss out on a day's worth of coverage here. Sarah, this is an interesting week, right? I, I felt like it was kind of nice to have a little bit of reset on Sunday, right? No Broncos game on Sunday. I feel like we could all, I think Broncos fans, and I think us, we could just sit back and take a breather, watch NFL Red Zone. I couldn't help but think to myself while watching some of these young players all across the NFL. And look, the Houston Texans, what they got going on with C.J. Stroud. To me, I thought to myself, all right, hey, you know what? There are a lot of young guys who are being featured around the NFL. And it got me thinking, the Broncos, with them sitting at 1-5, and five, they need to invest a lot in some of these young guys that they have on their roster, I think, through the remainder of the season, whether they start winning games and go on a run or whether they keep losing games. And I think first and foremost, we got to start off with probably the one guy. I think everybody in Broncos country listening or watching the show is going to say, Marvin Mims, we need to see more. And it's not his fault. It's Sean Payton. Sean Payton, if you're listening, we all want to see a little bit more of Marvin Mims. Why is it that they should focus on his development going further? Well, he's one of the most dynamic playmakers on the team, Cody. And I like that you're bringing this up because as you see young guys around the league stepping up, making plays, making their presence felt, it does kind of give you a little bit of FOMO, right? For the Broncos who have guys that are making plays, they're just getting very limited reps. And I think really for the Broncos, the young players have been the ones stepping up the most this year. I mean, arguably on both sides of the ball, right? And that's what we're kind of going to be touching on today is a guy like Marvin Mims who has made some huge plays in the return game, both as a kickoff returner and as a punt returner, deep downfield as a big play receiver we just haven't seen the Broncos attacking downfield. And Cody, I, I, I'm i wondering, uh, you know, what is the deal with Sean Payton on this one? Because we are seeing a lot of, you know, two tight end sets. We're seeing a lot of Michael Burton. We're seeing plenty of Brandon Johnson, Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, but we're not seeing Quinn a Bailey. lot. Of, uh, Quinn Bailey is out there as an eligible. <laughs> 75 is eligible more often than 19 is eligible out there. It's, it's really not good. And Maybe it's a state of kind of where things are at with the O-line and Russ maybe not being able to take very many seven-step drops or whatever the case may be to have those longer developing routes, whatever it is. I know the Broncos have tried a couple of times to force feed the ball to Marvin Mims in their you know patented wide receiver screen game, which is arguably the worst aspect of the offense at, at this point. But I know that they need more downfield shots. And Marvin Mims is a player that you used your top pick in this year's draft on maybe it is going to end up being that the Broncos have to trade somebody like Jerry Judy or Colton Sutton to kind of force Marvin Mims to get those reps on the field because it, is it that he doesn't know the playbook? Is it that he can't run the full route tree just yet? Is it that Russ can't take deeper drops, allowing him to utilize his vertical skill set? Whatever the case may be, it's a very frustrating tension to be in as fans of the team or people analyzing the team who are saying, hey, this guy's providing you some actual legitimate offense, whereas you're not using said player. And what's the deal with that, right? It's stretches of time. We see him explode against Washington, and then he disappears for a stretch of game. So it's just very confusing, I think, from everyone's vantage point of sitting here saying, why not more Marvin Mims? 
Well, you know, to me, it's just like his snap town, his snap total on offense just goes down or it varies within two spots. He's in that 12 to 15 snaps a game range, which it's just mind boggling to me. Look, and I understand like there's a lot of trade rumors right now swirling around Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy's name. And I understand maybe Sean Payton, the team, maybe they're trying to audition them. But here's the reality of the situation here, right? I don't think you need to audition them too much, right? Because the offense hasn't been productive in the last two weeks against the Jets and against Kansas City here. Cortland Sutton had a fantastic catch, which I think right now Cortland Sutton probably has more trade value than Jerry Judy at this point with some of the things that we've seen and everything that's going on here. But you know what? If the, these rumors are true, you have to invest in a guy like Marvin Mims. Like I, I don't understand why you're utilizing the 12, 12 personnel. You're using two tight ends and you're using an extra offensive lineman when ideally you go 13, but you don't have three tight ends because guys are banged up here. I, I do not understand why we're not seeing more Marvin Mims. And look, some people have said, well, this is Sean Payton punishing him for muffing the punt. No, it's not. Like, that's not it. Like, yes, obviously he's got to hold on to the punt. Sean Payton's not going to be a guy who punishes him on offense for that because this has been the trend all year that we've seen with Marvin Mims. They haven't featured him as much in the offense, but when they do outside of the screen game, nobody in the screen game for Denver's offense does anything with it. But when they feature him, good things happen, right? And it has nothing to do with him muffing the punt against the New York Jets. Some people said, well, it's because he fumbled the ball in the double reverse. That's not it either. Sean Payton even said that's not on Marvin. That's on the that's on the running back. We didn't get a good enough toss to him. So I don't want to hear these excuses because they're not true. The reality is Sean Payton is not using his personnel to the fullest extent. And when you lose a guy like Greg Dulcich to injury once again, look, now Marvin Mims is arguably your most explosive player on offense. To me, it's mind-boggling that he's not being used to the facet, which I think you you made a great point. You invested your top pick in this year's NFL draft to get him in round number two. Heck, you traded up to get into round two to be able to do it. So for me, I just, it, I have no idea what the direction is, right? We hear so much about the term vision, but you see these other young receivers getting featured that have, you know, maybe not as polished route trees or anything like that, but they're still finding ways to get them involved all around the NFL. And Denver sitting here just, sitting on their hands with one of the most explosive players right now in the NFL. To me, it's mind-boggling. I, I hope it changes because you can't keep on this trend here. I hope it does too, Cody, especially when I hear, you know, some things about maybe Marvin Mims' dad, you know, retweeting or liking certain tweets online that aren't necessarily speaking super favorably of the way that he's being used. And obviously that can be a way that you can get a glimpse into the way a player is thinking by, you know, connecting with their parents on Twitter somehow, you know, obviously dad wants to see his son do well on the field. He wants to see senior wants to see junior getting a lot of targets, but rightfully so it's kind of like you're sitting there. Your son's been one of the best players on the team. And you're like, why is he not playing? Why is he not getting these opportunities? And what's really frustrating about it is that the Broncos offense has, they, they've been running the ball much, much better the last couple of weeks, I would say. And I think with that, you kind of feel like, well, that running game should be opening up some of those passing plays where you can run that play action and get Mims deep downfield. We're just not seeing it. And I think to your point, Cody, about where Sean Payton is at right now and utilizing personnel, it's a great call out because it, it does feel a little bit like last season when we were all sitting there wondering the same thing about the different personnel the Broncos were using in, in 2022. And you could go back to when Pat Shermer was offensive coordinator and you're like, why the heck is this guy not on the field? Or why is this guy spending so much time on the field? So it's really frustrating from, from these seats to sit here and think like there's possible solutions out there and we're not exploring it. And then of course, I think Cody, when we do see Marvin Mims get more action and potentially more production, then we'll all sit here and be wondering how much different could those first six games have gone had you gotten him more involved sooner? Oh, what a question that is, my friend. And Broncos Country, we, we're eager for your thoughts, too. We want to know what you think about where Marvin Mims' utilization is from the state of the fan base. How are you feeling about that? Make sure you let us know if you're watching on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast here. But we're going to talk about another young player who has stepped up in the last couple of weeks that could provide the Broncos with some options in the next couple of years at a cost-effective rate here. We're going to dive deeper into a defensive player on today's episode, Locked on Broncos. Today's episode of Locked on Broncos is brought to you by our friends over there at the Game Time app, and you shouldn't have to worry about when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, the music, comedy, and theater events that are going on near you, and with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, plus views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, 
Game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Now, the Denver Broncos will host the Green Bay Packers this Sunday at Empower Field at Mile High, and game time is the perfect way to go see the game on a sunny afternoon, 2.25 p.m. Mountain Time kickoff in Denver. Game time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All-in prices show your total upfront, so you know you're getting a great deal without any hidden fees, and you can buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. This show is also brought to you by our friends over there at Prize Picks, and Prize Picks is daily fantasy sports done right. It's the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling against thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you watch the winnings roll in. Prize picks is the most fun that I've had winning up to 25 times my money this football season, and you just select two or more players. You pick more or less on their projected stats, as we discussed, and then you place your entry. They have quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types. That's what makes Price Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. On top of that, Price Picks now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits directly into your account this football season. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Once again, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. An injury paved the way for Jaquan McMillan to get onto the field this season. Obviously, no Kwan Williams in the nickel for the Denver Broncos. He's saying Bassey took his spot initially, but Bassey was benched and then cut, providing the way for Jaquan McMillan to get some action in the nickel after we saw some good things in 2022, or I guess early 2023 from him at the outside corner position. He's somebody who has produced every time he has been on the field, and we think that he should be getting more and more playing time as the season goes along. We're going to talk about exactly that right here on today's episode, Locked on Broncos. But before we do, want to give a huge shout out to every single one of you every dayers out there that makes Locked on Broncos your first listen of the day every single day free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Cody and I love getting to do this, and we love interacting with you. So Thank you for sharing the podcast on your Twitter page. Thank you for liking and subscribing on YouTube. We can't tell you enough how much we appreciate every single one of you and every day that you tune in. As Cody says, through the good, the bad, and the ugly, we know it's been mostly bad and ugly for the Denver Broncos, but hey, there may be some bright spots, including Jaquan McMillan, the former All-American out of East Carolina, turned undrafted free agent for the Denver Broncos was wearing number 35 last year. He wears number 29 this season, Cody, and he looks a little bit like a, a 29 that used to play for the Broncos, at least somewhat recently One Bryce Callahan, who locked it down in the nickel. Maybe Jaquan McMillan has a future there as a potential starter. I don't know what, what happens when K1 Williams comes back, but what's your thoughts on Jaquan McMillan from your defensive back expertise? Yeah, you know, I tell you what, like we saw him last year in that last game play on the outside, right? Played outside corner, did really well against Mike Williams of all people, right? That was a great surprise to see. But then he played a little bit more going into OTAs, going into training camp. And also we saw it in the preseason, played inside the nickel where, hey, he even got a, a sack in the preseason from a nickel blitz. But the thing I like about Jaquan McMillan, what I've noticed since he stepped into the starting role there the last couple of weeks, I mean, Sarah, when you see runs to the outside, I mean, he does such a great job, even if it's not even to his side necessarily. His pursuit to the football is something that when you watch on tape as a coach, you're like, you know what? This guy's playing with 110% effort. This is a guy who's playing with heart, hustle, and grit. But then he's a good tackler in the open field. He comes up and he makes plays. He's good in terms of his pass coverage there. And look, the Broncos right now, their defense, they're playing a lot, primarily cover three, Sarah. So he's always covering curl to flat, right? And I think he's doing a really good job of reading wherever the receiver is, right? If it's not number one who's sitting and he's floating out there, you got to look for number two. If there's no number two guy you're watching, is there motion coming across? He's smart. He's instinctual. And you see that on tape. 
And now he's really kind of jumped in and I think has emerged into this role here. Now I think this asks, maybe poses a bigger question is, what does that look like for Jaquan when a guy like K1 Williams does come back? Now, here's the thing, Sarah. I don't know when K1's going to come back because the last two weeks at practice, we haven't seen him out there. He hasn't been on the on the field for team stretch. He hasn't been out there on the side field. We have not seen him. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. Obviously, I think we can talk about maybe an underrated, under the radar storyline here this season. I think the loss of, of K1 Williams has been a little bit bigger than what most people have acknowledged here. His presence out there has been missed against the run and in the past, but Jaquan McMillan's done a really good job stepping up and doing those things effectively so far this season, which to me, it's like, all right, now you have a young guy who, hey, has a possibly on a cost-controlled contract with all this talk around rebuilding and going with younger players and seeing what you can do. Jaquan McMillan's the type of guy I feel like you can keep around, not to mention what he play on defense, but special teams. I love it, Cody. He plays such a versatile role, and we got a glimpse of that in that Chargers game last season, right, where it was kind of like just a little bit of from him of, you know, hey, this is what he can be. This is what he can become. And, and I think that maybe the Broncos getting an opportunity now to see him in the nickel is an opportunity to see him in a long-term spot. Like you said, we don't know when Kwan Williams is coming back or if he's coming back this season. I know there was some question about that in the offseason of like, is this a season ending thing? The Broncos went the optimistic route by placing him on IR after roster cuts and things like that. But you certainly have to wonder. And I look at the defensive performance against Kansas City. I don't think it's any coincidence that as Jaquan's role has increased, I'm not saying he's the sole reason for this, but we had some we had some comments in our post game, Cody, after complimenting the defense of people wondering, well, you gave up almost 400 yards defensively. How can you compliment that performance? Here's how you complement that performance. The Kansas City Chiefs were four out of 13 on third downs in that game. They were 0 for 1 on fourth down. So the Denver Broncos in critical downs and distance, they were very effective. And Jaquan McMillan with three tackles for loss was a huge part of that. So I'm very intrigued to see him get more opportunities. We saw him almost pick off a pass. I remember during the game, I was like, how it looked like he got both hands on the ball. It looked like he swatted <laughs> it down almost like a volleyball spike. Or something like that. But man, he's going to find the football and he's going to be aggressive, like you talked about. And that makes me very excited about his potential. Now, what are the Broncos going to be doing on the outside? That's a whole other discussion about other younger players. But I like Jaquan McMillan's aggressiveness. I think there is a correlation between how they played on third down against Kansas City, even the the couple of days before against the Jets. So they were pretty effective on third downs as well. Jaquan McMillan getting increased reps in the nickel. I think is a huge reason why. Well, and you, one thing I like about him as well, because this has been a problem for Denver secondary so far this year is communication, right? There was not a lot of communication when Bassey was in there, but it seems that Jaquan McMillan, anytime that there's a motion to him that he understands, okay, hey, this is how things are changing. He's communicating quickly to the guy, you know, whether it's Damari Mathis or Patrick Sertan to the outside, or he's communicating to the safety. Like you see him actively talking, moving and communicating. You didn't see a lot of that early on this season from other Broncos players on defense. I think that's what's impacted them with some of these big explosive plays. They're sitting there, they're playing cover three, sometimes cover six, but they're not communicating. And I also think he's the type of guy that I think excels in zone coverage, but he can also excel in man-to-man -man coverage. So for me, that gets me excited to see a little bit more of Jaquan McMillan going forward here for the Denver Broncos. And, and look, I think that if you're as a defense – you mentioned the performance that they had, even though, yes, 389 yards of offense given up. Bend but don't break. And look, there are a lot of people saying, well, the Chiefs were just messing around the whole game. I, look, the Chiefs got creative. They always get creative. But Denver didn't bite on a lot of that stuff, right? So it's like, let's not minimize what Denver de de did defensively in some improved areas there. It's not always about yardage. It's about key stops, crucial moments. And Denver's defense, in my opinion, did enough. They got enough crucial stops, unfortunately. You know, we were going to ask the question, what if what if the offense was actually moving the way that they have been so far this season? Maybe it's an entirely different game that we're talking about coming out of Thursday night football in our post game report that we did this past week. But you know what? We can always look back on and say, what if what if isn't going to matter, though, going forward here? But the what if that does matter here for the Broncos is what if they invest truly in developing some of these younger players? That to me, I think, is a major, major key to watch here going forward in Broncos country. There's another player on the Broncos offense, a young guy who we are all super, super excited about from our watching him at OTAs, training camp, preseason, and so far here in the regular season.
How can the Broncos expand the role of undrafted rookie free agent Jaleel McLaughlin? We'll dive deeper into that in today's episode, Locked On Broncos. Today's episode, Locked On Broncos, is brought to you by our friends over there at LinkedIn Jobs. And these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates that are available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. On top of that, it's easy to create a free job post in minutes over there at LinkedIn Jobs. Then all you do is you add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread word that you're hiring. They have simple tools like screening questions, which make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and just the right experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. Make sure you close out the 2023 year with the right team member today at LinkedIn Jobs. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. As we jump into the fourth quarter action on today's episode of Locked On Broncos, we're going to talk about Jaleel McLaughlin and why the Broncos should invest even more into him going further as the season progresses with the team sitting at a 1-5 in five record. Now you have two games in a row coming up at home, one this weekend against the Green Bay Packers, one next weekend against the Kansas City Chiefs, and you have the bye week. I mean, Sarah, at this point, look, there's going to be a lot of action going on here for this Broncos football team, and there's a lot of interesting developments that we're going to take a look at, especially as the bye week comes around. The NFL trade deadline comes around. Broncos country, this is the place to be every single day, all year long, Lockdown Broncos. So make sure you hit that subscribe or that follow button so you never miss out on a day's worth of Broncos news, content, coverage, analysis, and more. Let's talk about Jaleel McLaughlin here, Saren. One thing I felt really interesting that we didn't get to talk, touch on or, or you know, kind of expand on a little bit after that Thursday night game because there were so many different things we needed to hit on. But going back and watching the game, as painful as it was, I liked what I saw with the combination that the Broncos did with the run game. Look, the run game, they had, what, in the first half, 94 total yards of offense. 70 of those yards in the first half were on the ground in the run game. But, you know, you're trailing 13 nothing. So there's things where Denver got a little too cute. They had some turnovers, and that impacted them. But I don't think anybody's talking about the fact that Javante Williams, Jalil McLaughlin, and then fullback Michael Burton, they're the only three players that actually had carries from a handoff. Russell Wilson obviously had some scrambles. Samaj P. Ryan didn't get a single carry in this past game against the Kansas City Chiefs. He was in on key passing situations, though, which I find to be a little bit interesting. And could this indicate maybe Denver is moving forward with Jaleel McLaughlin? I think it does, Cody. I really do. Not only that, but I think there was a not so subtle message sent by the fact that Jaleel McLaughlin took the first snap with the offense out there. So he technically got his first career start, I believe, in this game, which is pretty awesome and an indicator of exactly what Sean Payton has kind of preached about it's not it's not necessarily the name on the back right or or the number on your jersey it's it's how you play that's going to dictate where you are in the in the pecking order of things and quite frankly i mean Samaj Piran has made bad plays in consecutive games the pitch that you mentioned earlier against the jets which was his fault and then against uh, obviously the chiefs he had the the fumble at the end of the game that was kind of self inflicted it Ultimately, it didn't matter. The Broncos were going to lose the game anyway, but you still don't like to see that kind of ball security when you're trying to at least get some momentum offensively. And I didn't think ball security was going to really be an issue for Samaj P. Ryan. Jaleel McLaughlin, though, Cody, he's still averaging close to seven yards per touch this season, which, I mean, is incredible for a guy that's his size and just the fact that he's undrafted. I mean, all these factors going against him. You can't say enough about, obviously, the story of Jaleel McLaughlin. I think that, you know, broadcast crews, they're going to lean into that all throughout the rest of the season, especially as the Broncos are bad. But I think in terms of the actual development of a, a player that's going to be a huge contributor to this offense, he deserves those extra reps. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see how does that impact a player like Samaj P. Ryan going forward? Like, could he be? Uh, I don't think the Broncos are necessarily going to try to trade him. I don't think it's a fire sale that's about to happen, Cody. But w- what's he going to do if he's demoted? Right? I mean, I don't know. I think that's a fascinating question. And like you said, he didn't get a single carry against the Chiefs. But I'm all for more Jaleel McLaughlin, no doubt. 
It's all about the explosive plays, right? Which is why it frustrates me so much to see. Look, I love that Jaleel is getting more run, but this is why Marvin deserves more run. You have arguably two rookies this year are your most explosive players on offense, and you're not finding ways to utilize them as much. Though I'd say Jaleel is probably being utilized a lot more and probably the effective way. But there were even times where they even went away from the run when it was working with Jalil and Javante, and they tried to pass it, and they had a penalty, or they got sacked, or something negative happened where you know it just forced them off the field once again. To me, it's just the definition of insanity, and we continue. And I think for us sitting here, and I think for anybody watching, we didn't expect the Broncos' offense these last two weeks to take a step back the way that they have. And now, look, everyone's talking about Russell Wilson right now. Obviously, he had a rough performance, but... John Payton also had a pretty bad performance as a play caller in this past game against Kansas City. And it's on him to also put Russell Wilson in positions to succeed. And look, I felt like he kind of threw Russ under the bus a little bit in his post-game conference. But to me, it's not just on Russell Wilson. Like, you're going with ultra protection and you're running two-man routes. Like, what do you expect Russ to do when you're playing against the four cover guys? You have two routes versus four or five guys who are able to cover and sit in those zones. To me... I think there's just a cop out there from Sean Payton. Look, there's been rumors. That, okay. Hey, Sean is now trying to move on from Russell Wilson. He knows he's not going forward. With, I don't know what to believe because I've seen their relationship at practice. I've seen it at training camp. They've got a pretty good one, but when you throw players under the bus or it's perceived that way, it doesn't go along well in that locker room. And I'm very curious to see what that does here, but now going forward here, maybe it gives us a chance to expand on this a little bit more, right? You look at the off season free agency signings that Sean Payton wanted George Payton to make. Sean Payton has requested those, and even Samaj P. Ryan, and look what's happened. Like A lot of these free agency signings, outside of, I would say, Ben Powers, Ben Powers has actually been pretty solid. A lot of Sean Payton's free agency signings coming into this year, not panning out so well so far in year one. And look, that goes with Samaj, who I thought had a really good preseason. We haven't seen that here in the regular season. Mike McGlinchey, he's had his struggles. To me, I think there are a lot of things we got to talk about. When we talk about blame, if Sean Payton wants to blame a little bit on Russell Wilson, he needs to accept blame himself about some of these signings that have not yet panned out in his system that he has built for this offense. Yeah, no doubt. I think you could look at any number of acquisitions the last couple of years, but especially this year as the team continues to struggle now, as we're kind of, I know we're wrapping this episode of the show up and this will provide us kind of a launching off point for episodes going forward. But I was kind of thinking about this, Cody. I mean, obviously the Broncos, they, they, they're way behind in the AFC West right now. The acquisitions are not working out. Namely, I mean, the biggest, the, the most high profile acquisitions they made name like Russell Wilson, like you mentioned, Mike McGlinchey players like that, that are not panning out as far as helping this team win games. Like they're supposed to be, you can't help but wonder, I mean, if the team's not going to tank, what does that mean? What does that look like going forward? What are they going to do differently? Could there could there be a, I'm not trying to, you know, pump out any false hope or anything, but I think about, remember last year at this time, the Detroit Lions were terrible. I think they, they started off one and six or one and seven or something like that. The Jacksonville Jaguars, as of the time they played the Denver Broncos in London, were what? I mean, they had won two or three games at that point and were looking like they were out of contention in the AFC South. And that loss to Denver was obviously bad, a very bad loss to a bad team. Is there a chance that the Broncos maybe get things figured out? The defense played pretty well against Kansas City. We've seen the offense play well. Are, are we just being a little too impatient as as fans for this system to take hold? Or is this truly a disaster that just needs to be burned to the ground? I think most of us would say it, it needs to be burned to the ground. But I also think that there's some validity to looking at those two teams last year who provided maybe a, a glimpse of, hey, stick to it. Stick to it with some of these guys. Maybe, yeah, maybe make a couple of trades here and there and let other guys like these young players that we're talking about get more playing time. But man, don't give up. Don't just throw in the towel on this season. Even if you don't win the AFC West, which you're not going to, even if you don't make the playoffs, which at this point seems like a pipe dream of all pipe dreams. Even if that doesn't happen, what if you could finish with the kind of momentum that we saw from Detroit last year? Or what if you end up getting lucky at the end of the season, like Jacksonville did to sneak into the playoffs and you see what happens there. I just think maybe there's a chance you go on a run at some point and it's got to start with one game and it just doesn't feel likely. I know right now, but man, get these young guys some more playing time. See what happens. That's all I'm saying. 
Oh, Broncos country. Sarah said it best there. What do you think about this conversation here for this team, especially with some of the things, look, this could be an entirely different looking team in the next two weeks. When we talk about potential roster and personnel changes, how are you feeling about things ahead of the NFL trade deadline? Make sure you let us know down below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening, wherever you get your podcasts, you can interact with us on social media at Cody work NFL at Sarah Bettinger here, but Broncos country. That'll wrap up today's episode of the show. The Broncos that are back at it this week as they prepare for the Green Bay Packers. We'll have you covered every single day leading up to kickoff, plus all the post-game action next Sunday here on the Lockdown Broncos podcast. Stay tuned throughout the week for all the news that you need to know about potential trades, roster moves, and other things that could be coming down the pipe here for the Denver Broncos. We got you covered every single day, all year long.